Sister Juanita was just telling me right before the service. Why well, that fa my favorite songs all fly away, you know that, don't you? <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite tie here. That's the one that says They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall Mount up. <laughs> Just wait to see if anybody else. Mount up on wings of eagles. I love this tie. I don't even know where I got it, but it's definitely one of my favorites. You guys have probably seen me wear it more than any other thing. Mainly because the wrinkles are there, so I know where to twist the knot. You know. So today's lesson is about one of our most valuable and important possessions. We all have it. Everyone, regardless of what else they may or may not have, has this. It's even for a person, possible for a person to, to sell it and still have it. After you die, it may, be, may still be around for generations. I'm talking about your influence upon the world around you. Each and every one of us has influence on the world around us. So many passages speak of the need for, the, for a positive influence, the importance of being a good example. Jesus left us an example so we might follow in his steps. If you look at 1 Peter 2.21, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Okay? Um, an example. Everything we do sets an example, doesn't it? In John 13.5 it says, then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Okay? Christ's example. He's given us example. What's he doing? He's influencing us by his example to the world, isn't he? Paul tried always to be a good example himself. In Philippians 3.17 he said, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Okay, And he encouraged Timothy and Titus to do the same in 1 Timothy 4.12 and, and Titus 2.7. Okay? Now, believing wives are urged to win their unbelieving husbands by their examples of faithfulness. In 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2, it says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So, wives should set the example for their husbands, just as husbands should be setting an example for their wives. Okay? So it's extremely important that we make that example the proper one, that we exert the proper influence upon our wives, our husbands, our friends, our neighbors, and you know, most of all, our children and our children's children. Those, if there is no early influence upon our children, and our children's children, how can we possibly expect them to grow up as godly people, as wonderful people, as the people you want to be around? So this passage in Matthew 5, 13 through 16 is most of what we'll be studying today, okay? But lucky for you, I put everything up on the board, you know? 
And the ones I don't, just write them down and look at them when you get home. Okay? The reason I do that is so that you don't have to wonder about whether what I'm telling is true is the first and largest reason I do that. And second is so that you're not distracted, just like during the communion. This time is our time to share with our Savior, and we should be concentrated on that. Okay? So it's not time to flip through Facebook. It's not time to look at messages or, or your joke site. Okay? It's time to listen to the Word of God. Hear the Word of God, right? So, it, so <clears throat> anyway, so we'll be looking mainly at Matthew 5, 13 through 16, and then I'll add a few passages in here and there as we go, but they will be up on the board. Now, this passage speaks vividly of both the power and purpose of influence. But I'm going to read through it once here. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine. Let your influence shine. <clears throat> let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Okay? That's what we're talking about today. Last fall, I gave several lessons about the Beatitudes. You know, I took them one at a time, and we talked about each one of them. And I still think they're the most beautiful writings, and, and the deeper you just look into them, the more important they are. They give us a marvelous outline of the characteristics of those who earn citizenship in heaven. Okay? It's like, you know, the United States of America gives a citizenship test for people who are immigrating to become citizens. And that's what the Beatitudes are. If you have those characteristics, you pass the test. Okay. You, you have the proper influence. A, a citizen of the heavenly kingdom, remember, is poor in spirit, mourns over his sins, yields to God, desires to be right with God, is merciful to others, is pure in heart, strives for peace with God and others, and rejoices even when persecuted. Okay? So after contemplating the characteristics of a citizen of Christ's kingdom, we may ask questions like, what is the point of having these qualities? And what is the goal or mission of this type of individual? Okay? Well, that's what we're going to get into. Our present text answers those questions for us. Individuals with the traits listed are the salt of the earth, okay? And they are the light of the world. And everything they do will be to the glory of their Father who is in heaven, okay? So let's take a close look at Matthew 5, 13 through 16 and what lessons we can learn. Jesus used two elements common to the ancient and to the modern world, salt and light. You realize that both of these elements are essential and necessary for life. We cannot survive without them. If we have no light, we cannot see. If we have no salt, our body will not function. So they are essential for life on earth. And, there, and so I think that's probably why Jesus used him. He began by saying, you are the salt of the earth in verse 13. In the, in the days of Jesus, salt had many uses, didn't it? It still has many uses, literally thousands of them. It was used as payment for services. You know, you could trade salt for other goods if you had a good supply of salt. 
it was that in a major element in some medicines and it was included in Levitical sacrifices even. If you look at Leviticus 2.13. Anyway, salt literally had thousands of uses. Believe it, Jesus had in mind two basic functions, I think, of salt. First as a seasoning and as a preservative. That was what they could have related to easiest. Most of us use salt for seasoning our food, right? I don't, but most people do. Without salt or a salt substitute, some food is rather bland. I mean, even though I'm not a salt user, it's hard to think of a french fry without just a little bit of salt on it. Or, you know, pork and chicken both need a little bit of salt to bring their, their flavor out. So some things can be rather bland without salt. In Job, we read, can something tasteless be eaten without salt? Right? Can you eat something that just had tofu without some kind of added seasoning to it, right? And that's what he's talking about here. Can something bland with no flavor be eaten without salt? Well, Paul referred to salt's flavoring function when he challenged his readers let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt in Colossians 4.6. Okay. When Christ said that his disciples are the salt of the earth, he was saying something complimentary about his followers and something derogatory about the earth, wasn't he? The earth, he was saying, was bland and without flavor. Without Jesus, life on earth is dull, Bland and boring. Many non-Christians are not aware of the emptiness of their lives as they rush from one activity to another trying to fill up their lives, trying to make their lives meaningful to themselves. Someday when forced to slow down by illness or the approach of death, those that remain outside the kingdom of God will have to face the meaningless, meaninglessness whew, that's a lot of word, isn't it? Of their existence. Because that's what happened. Only a right relationship with Jesus can bring in a genuine and lasting zest to our lives. We all need that. When Christ said, you are the salt of the earth, he probably had in mind primarily the preserving quality of salt. If we're the salt of the earth, how are we preserving the earth? In the days before refrigeration, salt was used to slow decay in meat, wasn't it? Galilean fishermen salted down their catches. When crossing the, the plains and the oceans of the world, salt, salt preserved meat, allowing longer journeys to new lands. Did you ever think something as simple as salt could be that important? Columbus couldn't have made it to the New World unless he had salted meat and salted fish to take along because all his food would have spoiled and he had had to return home or starve to death. So salt helped conquer the world, didn't it? Salt, salt allowed those longer missions. Well, Christians are preserving, are a preserving factor of the world. Did you know that? Your belief and your influence, remember, I did start talking about influence way back when, right? Your influence and your relationship to the world is a preserving factor in this world. The presence of just ten righteous souls would have prevented the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Just ten. That's in Genesis 18.32 if you want to look it up. Today, the presence of righteous men and women slows down the deterioration of this sinful world and gives it time to repent before the earth is at last destroyed. 2 Peter 3.10 okay. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Okay? Jesus' words imply that the world is decaying. It is the 
nature of meat left to itself to spoil, just as it's the nature of the world left to itself to deteriorate and spoil. If the world was just left alone, it would have been destroyed long ago. Okay? It's up to us as Christians to take the place of just ten people could have saved Sodom and Gomorrah. It's up to us to continue to preach the world so that there's that righteous group that preserves the world. How corrupt can the world world become? Well, we can get get the short list from from Second Timothy three two through through four, or read it even in more detail in Romans one eighteen through thirty two. Okay, you might want to make a note of that and and go back and check at Romans one eighteen through thirty two. It's it's worth a read. We'll, we'll just use Timothy here today. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, whew, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And this is the short one. Okay, go read the other one when you get home. This is just the short list of what's going on around us. And we see that every day in the people around us and in the TV shows that when you turn on the boob tube, right? And, and there it is, blasting you in the face. Filth and corruption at every turn. Even on, even on the Disney Channel, you're not safe. So, that gives us a good idea of what these sins and things are. You can look around the world. You see the lowered standards of morality, a general lack of honesty, honesty less diligence in, in labor. You try to find somebody to work for you sometimes that will put their stinking cell phone down and work. You can't hardly find it. Although he's not here, young man Xavier's come and visited with it a, a, a couple of times. He's up in prayer today. He works for me. And he was one of my students, so when he gets out of his truck, he leaves his phone in there. He doesn't even think about going to work with it. Try to find a few more of those. There's not very many of them. Okay? Because they're so preoccupied. I just made that one up. It'll be on Webster's list next year for new words. Okay. He's, people are so preoccupied with the social media aspects of life that they actually go into anxiety withdrawals when they're away from their phone too much. And used to, I, I myself cannot imagine going back to the days where I had to run home and make a call, you know, or I had to be someplace at a certain time to get a call. But, but the thing is, those things are taking us farther and farther away, and we're, and we're missing out on that diligence in labor, okay? Because people are preoccupied with things like that. It may be they're preoccupied with when they can smoke the next cigarette or drink the next cup of coffee. But there used to be a diligence in labor and a sense of urgency in performing tasks for a boss. You didn't sit there and say, well, why aren't you doing it with me? Because he was paying you to do it. If he'd have wanted to do it, he wouldn't have hired me, you know. But but that that's not seen anymore. It's just this sense that, that we want to be on equal standing and footing with everybody else. So we go and we've given that up. Okay, And more and more we see ungodliness at every turn. 
wherever we go. That's what our society is turning toward. When you think about the nature of the world, it is not surprising that it is so bad, is it? If you look at the nature of, of mankind, the nature of the world, and the, and the things it draws, actually it's, it's amazing, really, that anything remains good about it at all. That little remaining light in the world must be due to the influence of Jesus Christ and His example set by His followers, to His followers, and by His followers as they go through life. That ha We have to keep that little light glowing or it'll all go dark. That's our job here. Keep that little light glowing. In verse 13, Jesus is referring to the citizens of his kingdom who, who lose the qualities listed in the Beatitudes. They've lost that saltiness. They've lost that sense of spirit, that sense of mourning, that that all those things that are listed in the Beatitudes. Okay. Thanks to God's grace, there's a difference between men and salt. Okay. Unsalty Christians can repent. Okay. Unsalty Christians can return to God. They can regain their saltiness. Okay, so what what is the unsalty salt good for? Jesus said it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now, I could talk for this entire period just about how they used to use salt and, and where it went and why it's trampled underfoot is the phrase here and stuff. I'll tell you that because they threw the bad stuff out on the roads because it killed everything that it came in contact with. So what better place than the roads? So you walk on the roads, it was trampled underfoot. Okay, so that's why it's trampled underfoot. All right. And what's it good for? Nothing. So God's get grace for us provides reflavoring. He provides reflavoring of our saltiness for all his children. Jesus described a Christian who has lost an influence for good. Jesus said he is good for nothing except to be thrown out. Okay, That's what he's saying here. If you've lost your flavor, if you're not providing that influence to those around you, if you're not inviting people to the gospel meeting, if you're not inviting people to church, if you're not saying, hey, would you, would you like to study with me, then maybe you're not using your influence properly. Okay? The analogy of salt mainly focuses on the negative side or lack of Christian influence. In verse 14, Christ turned to the positive side. And that first we have one of the most astounding and extraordinary statements about the Christian that was ever made. You are the light of the world. In verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Okay. The Bible teaches that God is light, doesn't it? God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. 1 John 1.5 okay. Jesus said, regarding Himself, I am the light of the world. John 8.12, I am the light of the world. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Okay? So, and Jesus is referred to as the light in John 9, 5, and John 12, 35, and 12, 46. Also in Matthew 4, 16. Okay. So, we see this same theme. Christ is the light. God is the light. Okay. Now, using the same terminology, Jesus said to him, his disciples, you are the light of the world. He just compared them to himself, didn't he? As sons of God and as disciples of Jesus, we are to shine as lights in the world. And Philippians 2.15 says, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish and 
in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights of the world. What's our job? To be lights in the world. Okay. We understand, of course, that whatever light we possess does not originate from ourselves. We have no power to be a beam of light within ourselves. Our power comes from the Lord. That's what gives us the power. What good's a light bulb with no electricity? Nothing comes out, does it? Well, we're light bulbs. Christ is our electricity. He causes us to shine. Okay, Our light is but a reflection of His light. So without Him, we are nothing to ourselves or to the world. Paul wrote to the Christians in Ephesus, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In Ephesians 5.8. Underline the phrase, in the Lord. Okay? In the Lord. It is only in the Lord that we can be lights. After Jesus said, I am the light of the world, he said... He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Okay. John 8, 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. So what does, what does light do? Its primary purpose is to dispel darkness. What, what is darkness? Darkness is nothing. It's just nothing. It's not a color. It's not a shape. It's not a sound. It's nothing. You can't see anything in darkness. It's nothing without light. But you, it declares... <coughs> Jesus' statement in Matthew 5.14 says this about it declares that the world is in darkness. The world does not like to admit this. People don't like to admit they're in darkness, do they? People are fond of... We live in an enlightened age. We need to enlighten the world. Well, what are they calling enlighten the world? Destroying the sanctity of marriage? Opening up our bathrooms to opposite sexes. Okay. Throwing away moral standards. Embracing drunk drunkenness. Legalizing more and more drugs. We have some city or some states in this country right now that all drugs are legal. And and we know they destroy lives. We, you know, so it's darkness closing in, doesn't it? And they're calling that enlightened. Enlightened. If we, if we look at the confusion in the world regarding where mankind came from, why mankind is here and where mankind is going, okay, then... Questions we find no clear answers for the non-believer, do we? There is no clear answer if you're a non-believer where you're going to go. What's going to happen to you? Eventually that darkness will close in around you and you will have completely destroyed your life. Questions with no clear answers, but very clear answers are right here. Those answers are here for all those people that don't believe. Worldly minds are, are shrouded with a veil of darkness. Some of that darkness is the result of being ignorant of the light. Ignorant of the light. Jesus Christ. The Word. Okay. So, some of this 
will result willingly in their rejection of the light. They may have heard it and said, no, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to listen to you because if I listen to you, I'll have to stop doing something. I'll have to stop enjoying my phone and my tablet. Okay. And I'll have to start listening to the word of God. So I'm just going to ignore you or I'm going to pretend like I'm a good godly person and, and uh, I might go to church just because that's the politically correct thing to do. I may be surrounded by Christians. So I'll just go and, and that's okay. When nobody's looking, I'll doodle or I'll, I'll write a letter to my kids or whatever and, and just sit back here. But I'm in church every Sunday just hedging my bets. It don't work that way, folks. You're one or the other, right? So... Worldly minds are shrouded in a veil of darkness. Some of that darkness is a result of just being ignorant of the light. Okay, Some is a result of willful rejection. Our challenge as Christians is to dispel as much darkness as we can. And one way we do that is by teaching and preaching God's Word. Okay, God's Word, which is light. Okay. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word should be a light to our path, right? A light to my feet. Well, my feet need light so I can see where to walk. Don't they? And that's what God's word's here for. And that's what we should be little lamps running around to help guide the feet of those who don't know where they're going. Now you can actually see what today's background is, and you can kind of see how one little light back there can light up a huge area around it, can it? Just one light. And you can also look off to the, to the left of that picture, you can see how dark it can be when you're outside the light. That's how I can never imagine going back to that life of darkness that I lived before God. I, I would be so lonely without Him. I would be so lost without Him. I'd be stumbling around out there with nothing to guide me. I would not have eyesight I would not have the voice of God directing me where to go helping me make my way towards him and remember they used when sailors would go to sea wives would light a candle and put it in the window and believing that that would help to guide them home it helped keeping them focused that their husband was away. And and they could think, well, he can see that light. And when he's out to sea, he's thinking, she's got a light in the window. And I want to get home and see that light in the window one more time. Kind of a, a beautiful thought, isn't it? But that's what it is. You can have all the good word you want, but without the good walk that goes with it, you're still lost. So, will the world appreciate us when we shine our light in the darkness? A few will. A few will. And thank God for the few. But many will not. That doesn't mean we quit shining our light, does it? One result of dispelling darkness is exposure. In bright light, we see things as they really are. Okay? And we need that bright light, and they need that bright light. Paul wrote that all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, Ephesians 5.13. This includes exposing the ugliness of sin, and the, <clears throat> and the world hates this exposure. They don't want anybody acknowledging that what they're doing is sin 
They can't stand it, and they fight against it, okay? So we have to expose the ugliness of sin, and the world hates the exposure. Jesus said, the light is coming to the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. John 3, 19 and 20. Conflict between the children of light <coughs> and the children of darkness in, is inevitable because the lives of faithful children of God are a silent rebuke to those who are ungodly. So this can result in our own persecution, can't it? We can read about that in Matthew 5, 10 through 12. However, light does not simply expose ugliness. It provides the illumination needed to correct that ugliness. Okay, If we can recognize it, we can fix it. Especially, that's like these new cars. If I could figure out what was wrong, I could figure out what to fix. The Bible tells me how to figure out what was wrong. The Bible tells me how to figure out what to fix. Right? So, it reveals a pathway men need to follow. Therefore, the God, Lord God strongly urged his followers, let your light shine. Jesus said that our lights are to shine in a certain way. That's verse 16. Okay? Let, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus did many mighty works, but he did them in such a way that those who saw them glorified God. Okay. You can take a look at Matthew 9, 8 and Matthew 15, 31. The apostles made no effort to hide their works, did they? They wanted people to see their works, but they did them in such a way that people accepted Christ and glorified the Father. Okay, you look at it, good place to look for that. It's Acts 2, 43 and, and 5, 12. What we do as Christians should never be for our own self-promotion, should it? But rather to glorify our Heavenly Father. Paul said, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory of God. When Peter wrote about the talents God has given us, he emphasized that we are to use them so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. That's in 1 Peter 4, 11. Okay. So, Looking at this, you and I will never receive a greater compliment or a greater challenge than we find in Jesus' words, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Can you imagine the impact on the world if all who claim to follow Jesus fulfilled these two functions? If everybody who claims to be a Christian, if everybody who claims to love God, if everybody who claims to, to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, were just to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, how much could we change society? Whether it's standing up here and preaching a sermon, which really does very little, because if I look out at this congregation, I recognize everybody who's here. You've been here before. We've been here together before. Okay. So preaching only works if there's somebody new to preach to. Okay. So we need those new we need those new bodies coming in. And uh we need to be spreading the word going out from this place. Okay? In a world of darkness, 
this little place and this little building and these people need to be shining like a light. Need to be the light to go to. They need to be the lighthouse that the ship sees upon its return that keeps them from crashing on the rocks in the darkness. That needs to be us. Okay? We need to be out there shuffling our feet. We need to be out there passing out these pamphlets for, for our uh, upcoming gospel meeting. Okay? We need to be talking to people about how wonderful it is to be a Christian. We should never say, I have to go to church tomorrow. I get to go to church tomorrow. I was really, it's terrible of me. I was kind of happy that Brother Ewell wasn't here today because I got the chance to work on the table. I don't get that very often, but it's an honor to do. And we need to look at going to church and, and being together and working together and spreading the light is an honor and a privilege that God has asked us to do. Okay? So we need, can you imagine that impact if we could just all do those two functions? So how are you using your influence? You're being no use to Jesus if you're just here to keep the seat warm. All right. If you if you if you're here but not paying attention to God's word, you've lost your savor and you're not shining as a light. If if you're, if you're doing things away from this place that you do not want your brothers and sisters to know about, you're not letting your light shine. Unless you're planning me some kind of surprise party with lots of fishing time. So who, who have you invited to hear God's word recently? Did you come here to worship God? Or did you come here to worship your iPhone? Unlike salt, if, you, if you're a Christian, you can get your flavor back through repentance. And I hope you'll do that if you've lost your flavor. If you know that you need to be saved but are just being stiff-necked and hard-hearted, right now is the time to change your life. Jesus is waiting for you. He's here for you. Okay? If you're new to the church, you know, and have heard the word and Prepared to save your soul. Today's the day to do it. Don't put it off because you never know when the real light will return and take it those of us who've been seeking him home with them. You can't take that chance. We know not what tomorrow will bring, do we? So let us help you today to find that salvation you need in any way that we can. If, you, if you're ready to be saved, we're here to help you do that. If, you, if you're wandered away and just need somebody to talk about something you're going through, we're here to do that for you too. We have wonderful elders. We have wonderful people. We can set you up with somebody that would be meaningful with to talk to. Don't, don't put yourself aside or or, or fail to act upon what you know is right. Okay? If, you, if you're just here and you say, you know, just, I want to reach out and reaffirm my faith, we're here to do that for you too. And, and most importantly of all, if you've never been baptized for the repentance of your sin, but you've heard the word and you believe Jesus Christ, is the Son of God and He is your Savior and you're ready to, to put all those sins behind you and, 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 you're, and you're ready to feel those sins washed away in baptism and rise up and live a new life. We're here to help you with that too. Okay, If you're not sure what that commitment is, we're here to help you with that too. All you have to do is come as we stand and sing.